Hello everyone, today we make a summary or recap on the land or territorial scenery. So this is a topic that we have already addressed by um, territorial scenery, we can also uh, talk about the banal uh, lordship uh, more properly uh, if you want. It's also a matter of terminology because uh, I think every country uses different terms and has also different um, uh, different historiographical perspectives given their different stories but fundamentally we're talking about the same thing the development of the seigneurial prerogatives in this um, cortis or manorial or seigneurial system whatever you want to call it that entailed the expansion in fact of this landed uh, aristocracy that at the time was a bit everything was kind of landed in a sense obviously uh, owning the land was the first and foremost um, uh, you know, measure of, of wealth, uh, especially in this phase that is very overlooked in many ways, in the mm, not much just in the political, but especially in the socio-economical transformations between the fall of the Carolingian Empire and fundamentally the rise of uh, more centralized monarchies, also or city-states, however other entities that try to re uh, to to put together once again. Um, the political fabric of Europe uh, from the uh, previous fragmentation that had existed during the period of the, in fact, of the second invasions, um, etc. And this is a particularly interesting topic that, as I was saying before, I, I've made if you go in, into me the medieval um, society playlist, you're gonna find plenty of, of videos discussing um, banal lordship, this seigneurial slash manorial system. And also a bit of um, you know a, a bit of discriminance um, when talking about it in 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 historiographical perspective, like what is that we're talking about for which countries we can observe this the best and why, um, etc. Usually this is mostly a um, northern French and northern Italian uh, topic because this is fundamentally th these are the areas at the time that were. Um, were more advanced in terms of uh, you know the the ter of um, the expansion of feudalism in many ways, but also especially in this in in different ways in this dynamization let's say of, of or dynamization I don't know how you say it of the uh, also the market because this corresponds eventually also to the I mean, the, the, the seigneurial expansion does correspond also to the expansion of economy because it's something that went in parallel, both as a cause and a consequence, as a matter of fact. So, uh, today we make, in fact, a recap about it, uh, trying to highlight mostly the difference between the, let's say, the normal landed um, property and the banal property. So distinguishing these two kind of scenarios that, however, were deeply intertwined. As we will see now, there was no clear distinction even at the time what these two systems were. And in fact, I think that even when explaining this topic, um, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to stress this difference, but it's still important at a theoretical level to understand uh, this uh, especially in which jurisdictions it 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 was it, it was happening because one thing is the private domain another thing is the public ones and that we see what that the difference in fact laid um, in 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 this uh, in this middle so um, as we have already said also talking about the encastellation was uh, a phenomenon that goes uh, hand in hand with with this um, the the spread of fortresses of castles in into post Carolingian Europe was one of the uh, fundamental instruments through which gr the great uh, landed aristocracy um, was able to transform itself in a territorial um, seigneur, mm? Se uh, se uh, their properties into territorial seigneuries, into banal lordships, um, if you want. So, historiography has distinguished this kind of two forms of lordship the landed one and the territorial one. Mm -hmm. So we define the first as the landed scenery, um, as this uh, s set of powers, this uh, group, ensemble of powers, that a great 
um, owner um, de facto came to exercise over the workers of usually of servile uh, status that belonged to him hmm, personally and also on, on those uh, free colonists that worked on his own lands. Hmm. So besides uh, collecting the uh, rents uh, that could be usually in, in nature actually natural goods but also you know the, this time there is a you know rather weak but progressive growth of the uh, you know the spread of currency etc the the owner exercised certain prerogatives that went beyond the mere uh, economical relation right that uh, of the contract so the 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 workers their cultures at this point uh, owed to the property so to the owner several uh, donations mm, that were fundamentally fixed by the custom by, by the tradition of how things had had gone or uh, sometimes also by specific contractual uh, clauses mm. so this was pretty uh, hybrid because certain rela economical relations had been settled since you know a very long time uh, memory was kind of short especially among the peasantry etc and this had naturally gone in parallel with the increase of the power of the post Carolingian and I mean Carolingian and post Carolingian aristocracies and sometimes they had come to exist simply as relations de facto mm, that ev just eventually could be sanctioned by a political authority but usually that, that embodied the, the, the public authority sometimes sometimes not because a character of this senior is, is also the you know the private nature at the end of the day that and even when you uh, of, of their of their action fundamentally and even when you find in fact the uh, kings sanctioning certain um, certain prerogatives of these lords where you fundamentally realize that the lords had uh, fundamentally already uh, created them on their own so they, it was just a recognition of a situation that already existed de facto and that had been produced through actually illegal measures because it, it, it was the result fundamentally of the free action of, of lords that now were fundamentally doing whatever they wanted with the disgregation of public power and so on. Um, in, in other uh, cases that th there is nothing temporal or geographical in here it could be uh, it could be both in, in, in everywhere at the same time these actually these clauses these relations were in fact um, determined by contract so this was also perfectly uh, perfectly fine and the the birth of the seigneury is a contract is a social contract de facto it it it's it stemmed from chiefly from the needs of of military defense of the local communities that were growing poorer they couldn't fight they, they didn't want to fight but they needed to be protected and therefore they entrusted their own part of their own freedom by the way of action to to, to their lords so if, uh, fundamentally giving them all these uh, you know part of the their their their, their harvests their, their resources they they produced and therefore that the lord had to use uh, fundamentally for defending this community um, in arms and naturally this started as a very paritary thing i mean the idea is that that free peasants could could establish this relation it was a mere private contract with this other freeman that was however invested maybe with other uh, it could be just a, a very wealthy person without any public um, function but naturally with the the creation of the comital powers in Carolingian Empire th th that already existed before the Carolingian Empire by the way uh, there was the idea that uh, you know that still the private powers were fundamentally moving within a, fr a political frame mm -hmm. so with with a higher or, or, or lower degree of uh, political legitimization uh, at a local level. Um, so many factors also in here that intervene. Naturally, the, the, the second invasions didn't didn't help much to, to better the conditions of the peasantry. The, the, what the, the militarization of Europe brought, in a certain sense, to the uh, to the loss of 
power of the Freeman, etc. This is very well known, but uh, in general, um, it, it, it's often overlooked that this is a transformation that or was already set in motion before the second invasions. That the second invasions just accelerated, but it was fundamentally um, the 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 fate at one point of at least the major Romano-Germanic uh, societies uh, with the rise of a of an elite fundamentally and and the impoverishment of, of the freemen um, <coughs> this is all the more evident with the Carolingians that obviously uh, were the, the the ones who implemented through the vassalatic beneficiary system this uh, social that the accelerated let's say this social certification but also in the other kingdoms it was kind of the same it was a marked uh, difference a marked um, you know uh, you know the, the the Franks accelerated this way more than others. It was much more accentuated also before the, the Carolingians in the same Frankish goal uh, since the beginning. But it, it was fundamentally something that was characterizing a bit all the um, all the Romano-Germanic Europe and beyond. I would say because I believe that this was happening, albeit with less uh, with less. Um, speed also in countries like I don't know in Central Europe or in Northern Europe um, etc. Among those peoples that had not met in fact Romanization as well. Um, we, it, it's difficult now to explain why it happened because we would need another uh, video fundamentally just to explain this but just bear in mind that it's kind of a natural tendency and, and this has to do with naturally the way uh, wealth is distributed properties distributed uh, with the degree also of um, you know of wealth of a society and how the and the power the, the central power etc but it's something you find in ma actually at this point in, um, in everywhere in the world even in the Byzantine world even in the Islamic world etc the point that interests us now is however is that the this transformation was going beyond because it was sanctioned it it, uh, it was being sanctioned by itself and it was expanding on a political sphere uh, through jurisdiction how well so um, thinking for instance of these other exactions were asked um, for instance the the these peasants were usually subject to certain uh, obligations, such like uh, such as the famous corvée. Mm -hmm. um, so certain um, work service, work work services, work performances that were um, uh, that were to be uh, carried out in the seigneurial lands, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, there is also the dependency of these peasants uh, on the uh, seigneurial justice, the uh, in Latin known as justitia dominica. Um, so, uh, it, in other words, these communities were um, to ac had to accept in a way or another that it was the the land owner to um, to fundamentally. Um, you know, solve the main um, controversies that could arise within its uh, patrimonial uh, pertinencies. So, if this form of seigneurial power contains within itself already certain elements that uh, prefigure a control over um, of, of of public nature uh, um, over. Mm, these communities of this the, the, the actual freemen by the way um, this also happens uh, in and especially happens in the so-called instead uh, territorial old banal seigneury or, or lordship as you want to call it because such as um, you know as the um, the land seigneury is strictly connected to the great property and to the system the manurial the the manurial system uh, of production the territorial seigneury is indestructibly uh, tied to the phenomenon of the encastellation because um the banal lordship the the the, the territorial lordship um 
consists in the exercise of a series of prerogatives uh, in great part similar actually to the one of the landed seigneury but however that are applied also to certain subjects that are not uh, that aren't tied by any kind of uh, of uh, constriction of patrimonial nature to the proper uh, to, to the owner of the castles um, so this adjective territorial uh, I I or banal is meant is meant to mm, precise the the environment the in, in which um, the seigneurial powers are exercised which are not um, the powers that are not um, imposed on the single individuals that were economically subject to, to the Lord but to a group of inhabitants of a certain settlement. Um, as you understand the difference here is blurry because this could equate, this could consist, you know, could happen fundamentally at the same time um, and uh, the forms also didn't differ much after all. Excuse me, I drink a little bit. But it's still meaningful because the banal lordship was fundamentally to be accepted into the feudal system as a normal um, phenomenon in the, that would create in turn certain jurisdictions that were perceived to be kind of customary of the local place but de facto had been born also to this um, impositions that uh, the, the various lords with the use of force had managed to to obtain. Also in here it's uh, naturally very uh, blurry even um, at a juridical level because uh, most of the times we don't know wi when these seigneuries were actually born, how uh, I just explained that fundamentally the, the seigneury is born also for the sake of protection so um, the uh, naturally the, the juridical practices in all over post Carolingian Europe and beyond were quite diverse there were areas where naturally the phenomenon is more trackable because there was a higher literacy chiefly in southern Europe in northern Europe this is this was naturally very much you know sometimes we, we don't know there, there is a great um, a really great um, difference uh, a great gap let's say even in, in, in the various regions of Europe in terms of sources it seems sometimes that the, the local historiography sometimes is uh, more uh, you know you know you know ahead or, or backwards of hundreds of years depending on where you look at this but it's still complicated to see how certain um, of the, these relations were born because fundamentally some were happening quite spontaneously and sometimes also with an initial uh, acceptance of the local communities uh, but this is important because even in the full feudal age when the monarchies were expanding and kind of uh, um, sent you know bringing power um, you know centering power uh, w on themselves uh, the, the banal property so uh, the allodial um, the allodium was considered something kind of untouchable, something that was fundamentally being gained in in private ways that theoretically could still because everything that belong that, that that existed on on the kingdom's territory could be was was of the king theoretically, but nobody would have ever accepted that uh, the king could ask in fact for this private properties from from these freemen from the lords that naturally were also the ones that played into the political balance uh, of the same uh, kingdoms and the other political entities because it was considered like you know that is something un that untouchable um, in many ways and and there was a, a lot of cohesion in this sense from the side of the aristocracy you know uh, the Europe that emerges into in the 10th into the 11th centuries is a, a, an aristocratic Europe where fundamentally there is this great mass of peasants that do not count anything politically anymore or more or less at least the, the peasants never quite um, lost their actual uh, 
contractual power uh, uh, in this sense, also through the use of force, etc., to until the, the late Middle Ages. But it, it's mostly the aristocracy that now rules, that that fundamentally directs the world, the world society, and uh, that is extremely jealous of its own, of their own prerogatives, fundamentally. So uh, this is also important to uh, to bear in mind. So, um, within the uh, the castle, fundamentally, the lord could ask for certain work performances for several uh, for several services. Fundamentally, um, for instance, um, the um, uh, the the um, excuse me, I'm reading something now that I didn't check before okay <coughs> uh, sorry I, I was saying that um, the, the various services that the Lord could could exact were related for instance to the uh, maintenance of the uh, of the walls um, the uh, of the castle or the uh, guards uh, you know the uh, of the uh, of the fences etc excuse me here I would like I'm really struggling to check one thing that I think I'm an idiot I didn't look before what the hell <sighs> whatever sorry um, but other things like uh, the uh, maintenance of, of the roads that were extremely important made a video on on the nets of communication so this time and how the battle lordships were interested in keeping chiefly the, the communications safe mm -hmm. and also the maintenance of the same seigneurial residence that naturally was within the castle most of the times and uh, and and therefore that you can say that the whole communities that lived around gravitated the de facto around the the the, the 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 lord the seigneurial power in its um, demands so at this point the the Lord was um, was assuming uh, the prerogative, the, the right, actually, to exercise um, justice, to settle disputes, so intervening pretty heavily into society, because uh, things like the exercise of justice or the settlement of disputes was naturally... Um, remunerative there were you know uh, certain taxes that were associated to it certain privileges that were in by nature economical so whoever exercised justice at the time uh, you don't have to think it at like well well that's something that costs no it's something that is extremely productive and not just because of the collection of the five you know the the obtainment of um, the parts of of the, of the fines and the confiscations from the of the pun from from the punishments um, by the the, the justiciaries, but also and especially because um, you know backing one uh, you know deciding controlling justice at this point equated to shift power from one uh, actor to another. So you could definitely profit from you know what from corruption in this sense. And from uh, certain um, favoritism that were related to, to the various interests that the, 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 the nobility could have. This is why the quest for justice was something extremely important in the Middle Ages, and justice was actually the, um, together with, with military defense, in fact, the first duty of the sovereign. Um, because it, it you you normally even you know uh, after post Carolingian um, post Carolingian times it was a public authority functioning so theoretically there was always a uh, hierarchically um, uh, legitimate uh, uh, um, you know hierarchically ordered and uh, juridically uh, legally legitimated authority in these worlds so the point is how effective it it was at a local base and it's pretty obvious that most of the times it, it wasn't, especially in the peripheral areas where the the 
the kingdom, the, the monarchy didn't have uh, the direct control, including in uh, in those um, uh, banal lordships. In fact, where it was the local lords who effectively exercised just justice. But at the same time, uh, nothing was so clearly, you know, uh, you know, uh, determined. Uh, especially at the local level, where there was definitely a, an extremely intricate set of jurisdictions that overlapped uh, the one over the other, and therefore you could apply for justice um, to several authorities, and that naturally were uh, uh, that could be even spontaneously organized. I mean, you could be judged, I don't know, by the local bishop, for instance, or by uh, the local. Um, a town uh, hall, let's say, if you, and, and and this was a way, and this tells you how private and um, Europe had growth, uh, how privatized it had growth in in, in juridical, pra in political culture, and in juridical practice, Europe at this time. Now these are the centuries in which feudal law uh, is born, and feudal law is born through fundamentally this. Um, private prerogatives. Excuse me, I drink a little bit. However, theoretically, there was still a um, public authority that could uh, and, and, and would, if, if it had the, uh, the, the possibility, intervene to Settle uh, to settle the disputes to say okay well I'm the king in here, the emperor was naturally the 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 highest um, authority in this this context um, but we know how uh, imperial power especially in the West was was limited in this sense so it it was an extremely interesting and even in the sources you realize that there is all uh, this. Indestructible um, um, tangle of jurisdictions that were constantly um, also asking for justice all the time. We're trying to settle the problem uh, by themselves because at, at a certain point, if public authority doesn't work, you obviously search for someone else who can deliver justice, and that happened. In fact very often uh, on the basis of who had the authority to impose um, you know, the, the, the justice with, with, with an effective um, inf uh, to enforce justice in the first place. So someone who was armed, who had retinues, who, who tended by himself to already control and to pacify the community in order to, to rule it uh, anyhow. So um, this was Probably um, the uh, the greatest moment of um, I wouldn't say of juridical experimentalism because y the Middle Ages went far beyond that. But let's say it, w it was one of the moments where everything was built from from scratch in many ways um, because um, the others the previous systems had entered in crisis. The ancient Germanic law, the ancient Roman law were already theoretically there and sometimes were applied but and actually um, the, the there was they were also being transformed naturally from from what they 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 also were at the beginning and we're starting to mix with this set of of, of rules of um, of uh, of jurisdictions now that were being formed with uh, within um, the uh, the original public uh, domains, but now being completely, um, practically completely uh, new in many ways, we're being formed from scratch just on the base of the local power, etc. So you understand a pretty complicated situation, and this uh, wasn't actually a cause of chaos because sometimes you say oh well you know th this th eventually post Carolingian Europe went so fragmented therefore it must have been a mess but actually the the the, the real mess was the the moment right before I mean when there was really the problem 
of the uh, of the main uh, you know the disorientation where public authority was collapsing, and and the development of this new juridical system was actually um, a response to chaos and actually a, a way that effectively created new uh, a new equilibrium a new balance of forces that is reflected in fact the, be the beginning of the 11th century of the you know creation of certain lordships that had risen literally from from nothingness sometimes or maybe that had started from small counties but sometimes rising to the power of kings that uh, were exercising a substantial power um, in, in large areas of Europe and that were ensuring uh, somewhat a degree of of, um, of control and of uh, you know they were you know, uh, of safety of, of order um, in that eventually would and, and were actually since the beginning framed within a um, uh, you know the um, already uh, an order that was the the, the the same public one that, as we were saying before, had recognized partly since the very beginning such new prerogatives. The um, so a way actually to to work, and if you study these things from the sources, you realize how the Middle Ages was perfectly pragmatic, rational, and efficient in w in, in this because there is a problem let's let's solve it that that's the idea you never find you know these laws being just you know about sometimes you want to depict this especially these centuries um, together with the you know the very first ones with the middle ages as this dark terrible period where everything was chaos people lived in in fear and uh, in, in in you know in this complete anarchy but it wasn't at all like that and actually the the dynamism also of the same community from the lower um start of the population was was remarkable because you realize from the sources that these people were very intelligent and the that the solutions that they found legally speaking were amazing because they they were aimed to work they weren't just you know a theoretical uh plan to say okay let's rebuild uh, an ideal society from no these um settlements were uh, the uh, disputes were settled fundamentally um w with with an eye always to the concept of reason uh who was right who was wrong uh, which other laws existed before so it also triggered in part the uh, what was the revival of 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 uh juridical studies in in the following centuries this is um uh, and read some of these sources because you at that point you realize how intelligent the solutions were i mean you realize how inquiries were carried out how um certain rights were assessed um they were all deeply intertwined at this time there was definitely also the church that represented one of the um important most important actors in this sense also because the church was one of the few um depositories of sentences and um and that um fundamentally could uh, that 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 are the mostly the only ones that we can study because the, the peasants definitely didn't uh didn't preserve their uh their law uh, you know the the various um sentences even not even the lords actually because the lords were um in this sense more interested in in other forms of, of political interaction they they were more about arms etc also the um the monasteries had definitely their pri the abbots the bishops had their private armies um etc but they however had a much higher uh, contact with with written um with written culture etc and they stored their uh, also because of their immunities etc they they kind of had uh, an easier time and a uh, greater predisposition to preserve these sources and to, to show. And what is unfortunate, though, is that they naturally preserved only those <laughs> sentences that that naturally favored them, that had, you know, given right to them. So many others uh, are not. 
but it's particularly meaningful because today we live in a world where you have a um, a source of, of law, a source of right. You have uh, certain codes, they're, they're uniform, uh, there is a state that enforces the law, that has its own um, judiciary, uh, etc. And, and you, uh, you know, everything kind of works in a much more fluidified way. At the time, there was nothing like that. So these communities, the the intelligence of these communities is to be observed. In fact, on the ability in which they w were able to assess the uh, strength relations, let's say, and um, even these juridical sources show you who the various communities appealed to, because uh, at that point it was important. You don't ask for justice to someone who effectively can't deliver it to you. It's something very practical. It's very practically aimed and, and oriented uh, in many ways. So um, the the lords at this point were starting, the battle lords were starting to um, for in to uh, assume certain rights that had traditionally pertained also to public authority. This is particularly important because eventually the same public authority was to recognize it to them in part. So this reveals you the degree of privatization really to which uh, high medieval Europe had gone into uh, at the political and, and jurisdictional level because the same uh, public authority was fundamentally paying in in public rights for uh, assume, uh, reaching certain political goals like okay I, I want this lord for instance to be loyal to me I grant him a certain public uh, right uh, to be exercised on his um, on his domains uh, and or better I basically cede my public you know my my legal prerogatives to 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 him in his uh, in his properties, so that he gives me something back. And and by the way, uh, this was a very clever way also to to um, for the pu for that weak public authority that existed at this time to remain alive, to remain recognized, because it was still a legitimizing force uh, in in the overall balance. So if even if you were uh, very independent. Uh, and uh, already autonomous and uh, you know aggressive lord who wanted to expand um, even against the crown etc still it was important for you to have a document that said okay I have this uh, right now be because the king essentially gave it to me it's not it's not a few uh, because at that point you can't always say okay I can uh, even in front of the same king and saying look I have this prerogative now that is being given to me by the uh, same king so naturally the thing is extremely complicated because at the same time the kings didn't do it for for charity as you can imagine and there was all the problem saying you know who is the king what kind of juridical prerogatives exist and at this time there weren't Roman right didn't exist anymore e everything was very clear in Roman right um in uh, in the germanic load it was way more complicated because there, there was a, a distrust towards authority now there were effectively new powers that were forming that had never seen uh, especially in certain areas of europe had never been seen in such a degree of uh, you know of, of power of concentration of power at least and that had to be legitimized in, in a completely new fashion mm -hmm. So here we are well before the rediscovery of Roman right in the late 11th and, and in the 12th century. Here we are in a moment where consistently everything was done mostly through these private um, customs and, and, and contracts. Okay. So the, um, the Lord at this point started to, for instance, collect the taxes that were traditionally owed to public power as well like the fodrum that um, 
was originally the obligation to provide for the material sustenance of the royal army at its passage, eventually transformed into a regular, a regular monetary contribution, um, and uh, the uh, albergeria was the the um, the uh, duty of hospitality owed to the sovereign and his own uh, officials, mm? especially for even in here usually for for the fodrum was uh, for for, su for supplying the army. So it meant that when the king passed with his army, you had everything was kind of military based. Fundamentally, that's how it was also it's pretty meaningful because the greatest expanses of public authority w definitely were 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 the ones of, of war but uh, you know at all times now uh, nothing to be surprised of um, the, the albergeria was instead the actual housing of the uh, of the troops that that was a problem was not solved until you know like the 17th century uh, even later in, in Europe um, the um, the curadia that was also that was the um, um, market tax. So fundamentally, if you wanted to have market rights, you have to to pay a certain amount of money. Um, the teloneum, that is the um, the road uh, toll, fundamentally. So if you wanted to, because these were maintained, the theory was that you know, in order to for for these infrastructures and these activities to 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 be maintained. Uh, there was someone who had to pay for it, and definitely this uh, was a public duty that meant that, that the whole community had to be taxed for it in some ways. Um, and other similar um, uh, uh, tolls like the Ripaticum for uh, and the for the, the river fording, for instance, and the Pontaticum for bridge crossing. So uh, medieval Europe there was was a bit this um, you know extremely um, uh, thick net of of of, uh, of jurisdictions connected chiefly to to these infrastructures to the ways of communication, etc. Um, that uh, by the way were also of these river uh, waterways that especially in Central Europe were rising uh, extreme importance. Just thinking about all the various. Rivers like I don't know the 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 Loire, the Seine, the, the Rhine, the Po, etc. So all these um, big waterways that, especially in within during the period of the second invasions in within continental Europe, had r risen to be you know the the major internal ways of communications, uh, communication, and through which the the major uh, international uh, trade uh, was uh, trade goods were shifted. There is naturally also the um, def uh, defiance and other punishments that were inflicted to the uh, by seigneurial justice to the to the guilty that uh, also uh, in part went in form of uh, of money or other values to the uh, whoever exercised uh, justice in this case. There was um, there was also another uh, tax that was collected, it was known as the talliam. That was a uh, you know a pay payment in 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 cash usually that the entire community um, had to to pay as a recognizance of the function of protection exercised by the lord. So it was this idea that you know for military protection there is has to be an extra tax that has to be paid. It was also no, the talia was also known as the focaticum because uh, it was associated to every single fireplace that means to, to every single family from focums uh, in, in, in Latin um, and uh, this has um, also a great importance because uh, it was one of the most substantial ones and also theoretically one of the most extraordinary because it, it was just done every once in a while chiefly when there was a big military expedition to be mounted up, and it was effectively a, a good excuse to, you know, and this time, the the as we were said, the monetary circulation wasn't wasn't a, a big thing. Uh, 
but um, there is a progressive shift towards the increase of trade etc in the same certification um, of society that we were addressing before uh, went um, to um, you know to and, and the greater expansion of, of the seigneurial power in general and its uh, direct uh, directive capacities over society brought to the uh, also to the creation of sort of market of war for the idea that now the traditional peasant levy yeah could be still um, you know cold but it was better to just to, to make this talia being paid by the peasants for sending someone else preferably a professional milas to go out there fighting as a uh, as an elite cavalryman armored cavalryman usually and uh, and therefore being mo more efficient so uh, this was all a, a, an instrument of power and control that served to the purpose to increase this power and control chiefly through military expansion because you know locally sometimes we think that the seigneurial system in this sense was something extremely oppressive but it wasn't really like that because all these mo uh, resources either in nature or, or in cash were normally redistributed at the end of the day were all spent and this time the, the competition that existed uh, within the, the the various lords was not such for which you could just treasure your 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 resources sometimes it, it was done there were certain um, you know, uh, um, let's say stocks uh, that were 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 stored in in in, in warehouses, and especially in castles, etc. But these were mostly used for emergential uh, situations like wars, devastations, famines, um, and, and other stuff that could bring a uh, moment to another not to have enough sources, really, literally, to survive. But the idea that, and, and this was already kind of a great luxury to have, but the idea that the these lords uh, uh, sat on on a top of uh, you know a mountain of 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 gold, and that all the peasants were starving to death is a completely um, uh, irrealistic picture of the time. All this money was redistributed at the end of the day because even the same society was revolving now around the the lordship uh, the lord was not much in fact imposing his power it was it was literally the, the peasants needing some to, to find a work for serve a, a job for surviving for having someone who could protect them who could make them something to to live off um, and therefore even this you know mounted retinues that start developing here creating this military class of knights etc were um, something the community paid and was you know, uh, and the community was uh, worked and was paid for, like you know, creating a code of mail. A code of mail now was something extremely expensive. Uh, only several farms put together with a lot of hard work w could produce one. So, but there was still that work to be necessary. So you couldn't do without even the uh, this productive system. So that's also why the peasants had technically still a lot of you know. Uh, of importance uh, in the in the overall picture because everything now was meant to to go on and just look at the crop rates the crop rates were extremely low um, uh, a peasant could work his entire life and you know not even sensing uh, at the end of it the, the progress that had been done because the, the growth was extremely uh, slow. So the best way was also to, in fact, to expand. Why is it that raiding and all this endemic warfare existed? Be simply because the local resources sometimes were not enough to sustain or to, to to expand your own power. So there was no other choice but to to go somewhere else. This naturally was truer in in certain cases. This is not just a problem of uh, of post Carolingian Europe. You can see it basically everywhere. And in fact, basically everywhere, even in tribal societies, etc., there is fundamentally the same thing because the seigniory came through through other, uh, you know, it, in manifested itself into other dynamics. Um, now, in, in in Western Europe, in post-Carolingian Europe, it was mostly about this, you know, 
landed property this system was getting somewhat even more kind of dynamic diversified even in production having to do with the trade international trade was being revived but even I don't know in, in our places in the steppes in our uh, more tribal uh, it, it was like the same thing uh, there was a chieftain who uh, asked for um, kind of a tributes that are, are not very uh, different from um, from uh, uh, payoff hush money fundamentally uh, protection and uh, this was yeah there were a bunch of mobsters this is how Europe was it, it, it was the, the fundamentals if uh, until the, the the rise of the the centralized sta mo modern states the the whole world functioned in this way and there was no other way to make it function differently um, so uh, what is important now is understanding how uh, this happened in fact in various areas in order to to realize how what the the, the differences and the to observe the differences and the the other characteristics of these of these worlds and this is always useful I mean when you have something certain systems that are relatively homogeneous um, sometimes it's more difficult to spot the differences but at least um, you know uh, everything is so homogeneous that every time that something changes you know, it's not the crop rates were substantially different in many um, different in many areas of the world now. So you can evaluate and assess other uh, characteristics that have to do at that point with other dynamics, other systems, etc., that are developing within these societies for other reasons. Um, the the Lord in all this also established a monopoly on the selling of the of uh, vital products um, like salt for instance salt was the basically uh, the only uh, way to preserve uh, food at the time um, and uh, yeah okay there were other ways but chiefly salt was was so important it was extremely precious and the the trade of salt was something uh, around which certain uh, cities made their their living from think about you know, uh, places like in the Venetian Lagoon, or even in in Salzburg, that <laughs> took its name exactly from the the, the burg of the salt, uh, because that was uh, you know an extremely precious resource. Uh, that in fact, this various noblemen tried to 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 control directly with a monopoly. But uh, there was a a, con a very strong strict control naturally also on the same means of production like for instance on on grain milling mills at this time were some of the most important mo m most um, uh, pre um, um, uh, m most valuable uh, infrastructures that existed at the time they were very much protected they were um, they were regarded highly uh, because they effectively could produce many they could mill many uh, uh, grades, uh, great amounts of cereals, just exploiting uh, the the current the currents, uh, etc. Uh, but the same goes for the oven, ovens, like for cooking uh, bread, uh, that also required, you know, metal, the um, all the, the the coal, the wood. So all uh, very important uh, means of production. Um, and, and grazing, uh, for instance, was another. Uh, the grazing rights were particularly uh, important. Um, you know, the, the lords collected sums to allow grazing, uh, also for the use of water, the exploitation of the woods, um, play, uh, lakes, woods were at this time extremely important. Uh, there were certain lordships that were born fundamentally around these goods. Um, the uh, the the woods were at this time all extremely um, well kept. Um, they were deeply populated. Uh, pigs were sent to uh, to 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 eat in there. Uh, fishing was extremely important in the uh, in the river basins, uh, the in the water basins. So um, 
these were also resources that could make you extremely rich, especially in Germany. If you, if you think in Germany were these extremely based forests that sometimes were certain places were even so thick that they, they, they couldn't be surpassed. Um, and they effectively divided great chunks of Germany that remained, in fact, uh, you know, disconnected from each other because of these uh, natural borders that were extremely rich and were local lords that were struggling even for keeping control in there, like for slaughtering brigands and and having a um, you know a free access and exclusive access to these votes. Naturally, you can say, well, who were these lords for <laughs> claiming power? Well, yeah, but they had been building their their power and and over these resources in keeping them as uh, quite jealously as their, their own prerogative. Um, so, what is interesting is that from the looking at the, uh, you know, the, the from the perspective of a lord, say, when you want to distinguish the feudal possessions from the allodial ones, it is fundamentally the, the properties that are entrusted to a lord um, uh, by the public authority, by the king or, or whoever was like the, the superior in the Vassalatic um, hierarchy. Um, and uh, the alloyal ones, the, the ones with full property, it wasn't much of a difference because fundamentally these lands came to be um, ruled at this time kind of very, um, very easily, in a very indistinguished way. Like there were still something were th th that was cons constantly exploited. When you want to define the seigneurial territory or the banal territory, uh, what you have is uh, just imagine like you have so many uh, either feudal or allodial properties scattered, uh, discontinuous, like one here, one there. The seigneurial, ter um, uh, the the territorial seigneury, the, uh, is something that fundamentally is created within. Uh, I mean, in the area that comprehends all these properties. Because from these, you still attract other people who live around. You still control their economy. You still control their, uh, say, the communications. You still have an influence on these lands. So this is also why, cartographically speaking, it's it's impossible to represent much of many of the, of the actual, medieval power, uh, on, uh, at a territorial level. Because, just like today, by the way, I mean it's not something excessively different. Is that you can have a certain jurisdiction, certain rights over, uh, uh, let's say, even a, a, an extent, a part of of of, of land, uh, but the um, your influence goes far beyond, and sometimes you come to encompass certain um, certain uh, domains that are not yours, but fundamentally yours, your uh, th they're within your orbit and you are effectively influencing and, and controlling in some ways. So this is very, very important to, to, to understand and to, uh, to, to frame because it was all like this. And, and the problem for you was that there were so many other competitors all around that it, it didn't suffice to, to, um, to just stay there and say, okay, well, I expand, because there were other people who were trying to do it at, at your expenses continuously, and you were obviously always, uh, you know, risking. And and this is why even the peasant communities, albeit being declined as the original freemen communities, etc., um, still had a, a great power, because they could... Um, easily shift these precarious balances just with their participations. The peasants at this time were still very uh, very violent, you know, the re peasant rebellions could really make a mess. They were quite active, quite competitive. So everything was based on a compromise, was on an equilibrium. So uh, 
the story, the classist perspective of the terrible uh, landowners that exploited the, the poor peasants. It's not like that, especially at this time in history. That absolutely wasn't like, like that at all. That, that is something that pertains to the modern age, not to the Middle Ages uh, at large. And, um, and it, it's extremely important to, to remind, wherever, you know, if you want ever go to, to make a university exam, uh, always bear in mind that peasants no, are not, you know, we sometimes look at uh, the ancien regime society without understanding that it started just to crystallize like the way we stereotypically think of it towards the end of the Middle Ages and not and not the way it is uh, it is uh, uh, you know thought in that the other way um, so as you have probably understood and as we have already said before uh, the distinction between landed and territorial scenery is pretty loose. Uh, it's even very difficult to define. This, these are definitions that um, were conventionally created by historiography in much uh, later times, naturally, to, um, to describe a very complex reality in order to, to understand it and to interpret it. But exa exactly for this reason we shouldn't think that the men of the time were actually aware of living subject to one rather than another f form of this exercise of seigneurial prerogatives. Um, it, it's however certain, uh, on the other hand, that the forms of power that were created between the 10th and the 11th century brought to the multiplication of these exactions and impositions um, on the backs of the inhabitants of the countryside to the um, uh, even to the rise of a certain sense of, uh, of conflict that was inherent to, to this balance because there was a pressure this time that definitely was increasingly perceived um, as we're, we, we have just said, uh, things uh, started at this time to become really difficult for uh, for the local communities in terms of you know uh, who commanded and who had to obey fundamentally. But so if you look at, at the castle, you you could see that w around the, uh, around it there could be inhabitants of extremely different condition. Um, that could be also economically subject to a lord um, and um, uh, in and at the same time to, to another one. This also often uh, happened that you could work fundamentally for, for several lords at the time that maybe were also in conflict one with another. Um, so this this uh, was extremely uh, easy to do. I mean, that it could be a peasant that literally lived uh, next to another that was a complete, a different, even juridical condition, or that was tied to, to another lord. Um, everything was very f parceled, fragmented. Um, when we think about this uh, seigneurial lordships, we don't have to think about something unitary, physically speaking, like really a contiguous amount of land. There were lordships that had you know, the properties that were even hundreds of kilometers away from the core of their their domains. Um, so it, it's um, it really depended, and, and this is extremely true, is explicit, uh, especially true in those lands where there was a higher economic economical activity, where trade was more dynamic, where money w was uh, you know spreading faster and literacy was higher um, that's also why um, certain um, um, seigneurial um, uh, re regimes were created not much because of a you know pregressed aristocratic presence in our territory but sometimes I don't know there were literally uh, freemen that built a castle just to sell it. So also the myth of encastellation, like you know, 
at a certain point Europeans started building castles because uh, you know enemies came around th that never happened the, it, it's never been um, like that certain castles were built because of the invasions but most of the castles and also the ones that lasted more uh, uh, you know the, the way more than the temporary invasions were the ones built by the lords to make money on their own land and to subject the, the, the surrounding population even for the sake of defense but not not exclusively and actually not even for the ma major part um, it's shameful how history is told sometimes today like you know we have to project modern um, hysterias to to a world that the average person know fairly nothing about pretending that it's like he or she wants because you know it, it sounds cooler it's it's not like that um, the um, the 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 conflict of this world was starting from within itself this is what I've been trying to explain even when when talking discussing about the the causes of the um, vulnerability of Europe to the second invasions this vul vulnerability was um, within the same post Carolingian world late Carolingian post Carolingian world not into the invasions themselves the invasions were just a consequence of the internal weakness of, of continental Europe not the other way around and partly they were even favored by actively by the locals who wanted effectively to you know to get rid maybe of a uh, imposant monarchical authority that wanted to centralize while they wanted to, to be autonomous that's how it easily happened uh, in many ways there were areas of Europe that saw the rise of encastellation at the very end of the migration uh, excuse me of the second invasion period because before the countryside was too insecure economy was crippled then the uh, the 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 invasions stop and people can finally now start building castles it also costs a freaking lot so it's not something you can build like you know can pop up like mushrooms just because you know uh, you wish that uh, you need resources you need uh, a vision you need a, pl a planification you need a, uh, a a control of the territory that that is particularly important so the, the idea of conflict is something that is extremely relevant um, as an outcome of this situation because the those two neighbor peasants we're talking about before as an example could be enemies for instance could have different interests because they were tied to different circuits to different clientels to different interests and and this was a net that went it was not just a local base it, it started from the local base and it arrived up to the intercontinental relations for real uh, here we're talking about you know periods like the, the Ottonian times where so uh, all the kind of possible relations in this sense with the, with the various powers etc that deeply influenced what was happening at the local level simply on the base of international relations and the other way around um, the um, there's also to to realize that this conflict uh, increased the um, the patrimonial and personal dependence of the uh, individuals because it also meant that if this uh, uh, the, the situation uh, they obliged you to to side from one side or another to take action and therefore your choices also had to be um, comforted by the presence of s a certain degree of safety so putting yourself under a powerful nobleman was definitely uh, a very profitable option it was a kind of an investment even for you for your family for your successors etc um, and it was a lot of um, this sense of um, hereditarity 
uh, in in the the idea you know that, that serving a certain lord could also equate to to make uh, a lot of career M actually most of the low medieval european nobility was uh, you know stamped uh, actually stamped from n not even freemen originally just maybe serfs that had always been following their lords and had been in and for generations and had managed to obtain the, the administration of a castle and then maybe the, the, the lord died and they remained at the head of that castle and that became de facto a nobleman also because in here it was all extremely fluid from a social point of view I mean the, the there was a, uh, an increasing certification but this process occurred in fact from through the the competition of the various elements of that society, the struggle to reach the top, and if you had a, you know, how to fight on horseback, how to, you know, if you could wear uh, an armor and uh, and then use a sword, you could definitely, you know, make a fortune, and to win your fief and becoming someone, and that there is all a, uh, a very important net of relations in this sense, also matrimonial strategies that are patrimonial strategies at the same time um, the um, the 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 various um, seniorial uh, rights also were uh, assimilated this is probably one of the most important things in the praxis um, of uh, property law which means that if, for instance, one castle at the death of one lord, um, that for instance, that, that a castle could, uh, the death of the lord could be fractioned in different parts that corresponded to number and the consistency of the uh, heredi hereditary quotas. So these quotas were fractioned, and together with them, uh, all the attached seigneurial rights. Um, so, because uh, also in here it's not really territorial. When you think about these quotas, they are literally, you know, th the amount of properties that could be land most of the times, but it could be the castle. But it it, it could also be the, the simple jurisdiction, which meant that, for instance, you could inherit, I don't know, one jurisdiction that was um, scorporated from any. Um, from any uh, property, so maybe the land over which that jurisdiction could be uh, exerced, uh, exercised, sorry, uh, belonged as land to someone else, but you could come there to collect certain taxes, certain tolls. This also happened, and naturally everything was commuted. Was an extreme dynamism into in the thing. You could sell jurisdictions, bind them. Uh, it all functioned like this, so it could be really be complex. It really had to do with the value of of those attached jurisdictions most of the time, rather than the actual um, the actual um, uh, goods that uh, you know the, the property, the land, or the, the castle, etc. And naturally, it was much easier to control one land. I mean to exercise a jurisdiction with one castle, so that's how in fact castles were were important in this uh, because you're obliged sometimes whoever wanted to pass to to pay taxes to you at this time armies were kind of small because there weren't big political entities, so even just one castle uh, posed a, a for instance a tactical problem. There also came to be a strategical problem on the longer, on the larger scale, that, I mean, could be solved only by powers of a certain greatness. So, um, it's particularly complicated even to observe, but at the same time very fascinating. Um, so, property was fractioned together with the annexed seigneurial rights. Okay. Um, the single quotas, as we've said, could be freely sold. The uh, pure chasing documents attest witness the division of a castle, even up to you know the 
12 or even 18 parts so this tells you how parceled the whole thing could get and, and the more it is I would say and the more you find a, an economically dynamic system uh, that's also why in certain areas feudalism was also weaker because generally speaking there was a greater dynamism from other uh, sectors of society not just from the aristocracy and even the same aristocracy now was suffering of it especially in southern Europe with the Mediterranean trades well feudalism suffered because the cities were rising they were becoming more powerful more competitive um, the the lords usually had developed into the countryside so they had eventually to go living into the cities in order to maintain their power their their, their prerogatives their um, their um, the, their their potential the capabilities so this is particularly particularly important to to remind um, but there are many other uh, similar uh, cases in history this is just particularly important because um, it, it's particularly intense in this phase and it's something that paradoxically brought to an order that it wasn't uh, a simple you know this thing got messed up and you know, there's nothing we can do about it it actually produced albeit slowly a system that uh, sorry that got stratified yeah sorry again and that uh, was the one over which the same monarchies actually came to 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 strengthen themselves to base themselves I made a couple of videos in, uh, about the the rise of the high medieval monarchies and you realize that now these monarchies weren't really reaffirming the ancient public authority uh, authority in order to rise to the top of the world they were us using this ex uh, the same exact uh, private means of patrimonial competition that this uh, uh, the aristocracy the, 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 the rest of the aristocracy used so it's as if kings were just like you know bigger land owners and they were you know very often certain vassals were more powerful than the kings uh, themselves something about the kingdom of France that that in, in this time was 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 like this um, so yeah, it, it's interesting. Um, I'm covering now these topics. I don't know how often I will be talking about them again, but I think they are very important because they make you understand so much about that society, that world, that mindset, that political dialectics, and that um, um, you know, ultimately that political balance, by the way, that that existed at this time, and that shows you who was really in charge of the power so uh, it's 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 an extremely fascinating era and also pretty much overlooked i think in history uh th this is uh you know a phase of history that was particularly studied um you know a couple of tens of years ago it was kind of more it was a higher tension towards it now we are shifting more to the ideal once again, but these studies they they started yeah mostly from a structuralist um, perspective, but they are important to be considered because they they give you a, a more solid um, dimension of uh, how can you study for instance poli even military matters if you don't consider this patrimonial basis it's imp it's impossible fundamentally and. And and these are rather obscure phases of history that even archaeology can sh shed um, a lot of light on because they're re relatively recent times. Archaeologically speaking, much can still be found, but we prefer to spend money maybe just for the ancient era when we have to make uh, archaeological um, missions. And uh, and maybe we, we we nobody cares about this phase, but this phase is so important. Uh, there is so much still to be found, and uh, sometimes the same uh, l geography uh, can still have. You know, there are entire settlements, or that that has to be to to be found still in Europe that we ignored that existed at the time, and that were there and that had an extremely important. 
uh, weight and if you study all these things from a local perspective I don't unfortunately but I know some colleagues of mine that they are very much into this uh, th you know how important th that is because in the whole history of the, the major events that we normally study and we mostly focus on because we have this obsession of the great states, of great empires, ah, the big thing. Now, well, it all started from these bases. And what makes those periods so cool is actually that there were, say, continental powers that floated on the base of these local dynamics and that we don't recognize uh, and we uh, for which we have necessarily to project this idea that you know if there wasn't the centralized state nobody could work nothing could work instead here you find even empires that could work on the base of this and uh, but unfortunately we are modern people and as modern people we are obsessed with modernistic technologistic um, progressist mythology and we can't live without those because you know we are not as intelligent as a matter of fact as people one one thousand years ago were actually actually were so well let's hope to be a bit better in the in the future also learning about this stuff however For now, I uh, I think it's enough. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like, or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye.